everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, those from the ICSI who are enduring another hour and a half after doing, having such an endurance test this morning. But it's my enormous pleasure, my name is Ann Stoller, to open the 2018 Institute of Critical Social Inquiries. This is our public lecture series. Um, with someone who stands as at once the paragon of the New School's commitment to critical inquiry and in and beyond philosophy, a figure celebrated for the breadth of his influence and relevance across the decades of his scholarship. And I welcome Richard Bernstein sitting up front, the virilist professor of philosophy at the New School, who stands for many of us as a cherished thinker, a teacher, a colleague, and I feel honored to count him among my dear friends. The respect he's garnered derives from so many domains that many of you know, which is why you're here, of his work on American pragmatism, critical theory, social philosophy, political philosophy, and hermeneutics. From his books that have become in really quick succession, classics of critical thinking, from beyond objectivism and relativism, to the new constellation, to radical evil, a philosophical interrogation, and not least his always illuminating excavation of what thinking and politics has meant for Hannah Arendt. I also have the pleasure of announcing, I should have it in my hand, but I don't, his forthcoming book, there's a discount sheet as you walk out, um, Why Read Hannah Arendt Now? Um, also the subject of his ICSI um, master class this week. Those whom I, I call to conduct the master classes of the ICSI, as I said last night, are not only intellectuals of a certain stature and breadth, but as importantly, those who care about pedagogy deeply and I think in unusual sorts of ways. Dick Bernstein is a quintessential example of that. What stands out and has always struck me is the spirit and the creative energy behind his scholarship, his refusal to abide by the divisions between continental and analytic philosophy, which right there is unbelievable, right? His unadorned writing, his truly unique respect for accessibility, his capacity to make the most complex of philosophers those with whom we want to engage and need to know more and to understand better. Dick attributes to Hannah Arendt the insight that you produce thinking by infecting others with perplexities. I think it's a strikingly apt description of what Richard Bernstein does as well. He's a teacher in everything he does, and that's not always the case for really wonderful writers. He, he does reminding the most schooled and the neophyte among us. Equally, why we need to ask certain questions, hone our queries, as he provides not answers, but a style of thinking that allows us to value some acts and some directions of thought over others. He has this uncanny capacity to remind us why we need to read Gadamer, and do we, and treat Socratic irony as vital resources for today. The nurturing of critical communities is something for which he's widely known. That goes with a refusal to ever hide behind obscurest thinking or jargon. While it was Lear who said of Richard Rorty that he embraced committed reflection, I think how apt that is for Dick Bernstein, and perhaps more so because he's a political force, I think, in his own quiet right as a teacher, and it is teaching us not what to think, but how to think that is his enduring gift, and what endows his work with such inimitable grace. While I can't claim any privilege in being nourished by Dick Bernstein's inspiration, I can claim his force in bringing me to the new school, and the always demanding effect of his politics and prose on me. His books feel like intense conversations with a trusted friend. What you thought you knew, he helps you think again while well, he conveys a passion for new ways of looking at the world and the possibilities for accord within it. 
So join me in welcoming him tonight. He'll be talking to us about Hannah Arendt's surprise, surprise, on political responsibility and judgment. Thank you. Good. Okay, now can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, I'd like, before I begin, I'd like to say two things. There's something in my life that I know I did right. And what I did right is when I was dean of the, at that time called the graduate faculty, I was involved in the appointment of Ann Stoller, who has made a fantastic difference uh, at the new school. And it was one of the most intelligent things that I have ever done in my life. The second thing I'd like to say is that I've always had a fantasy. He, when you hear an introduction like that, I've had the fantasy, well, after something like that, I'm just going to walk out. I mean, <laughs> but I have never yet had quite the courage uh, to do it. But I want to thank you, Anne, for the kind of wonderful uh, introduction. And, and not only the, I mean, the content is, uh, is, a, is I think a success of the style is just beautiful. Okay, so thank you. Okay. I want to begin by, with one of my favorite quotations uh, from Hannah Arendt, because it will set the theme of my talk this evening. And this is what she wrote. She said, I've always believed that no matter how abstract our theories may sound, or how consistent our arguments may appear, there are incidents and stories behind them which, at least for ourselves, contain in a nutshell the full meaning of whatever we have to say. Thought itself to the extent that it's more than a technical, logical operation which electronic machines may better be equipped to perform than the human brain, arises out of the actuality of incidents. And incidents of living experience must remain the guidepost which thinking soars and into the depths into which it descends. It's a quotation from an article which has just been made public in the latest anthology by uh, Jerry Cohn. Now this, I think, expresses a fundamental commitment that Arendt expressed in many of her writings. And it really deeply influenced, I think, her style of thinking. And I want to use the passage which I've just cited as a guidepost to show how incidents of living experience shaped her thinking about responsibility and judgment. And I'm going to interweave some of these incidents with her thinking. In a famous interview, which we read in our seminar today, that Oren gave in 1964, she was asked, is there a definite event in your memory that dates your turn to the political? And this is how she answered. I would say February 27, 1933, the burning of the Reichstag and the illegal arrest that followed during that same night. As you know, people were taken to the Gestapo cellars and to concentration camps. What happened then was monstrous, but it has been overshadowed by things that happened later. This was an immediate shock to me, and from that moment, I felt responsible. That is, I could no longer be of the opinion that one can simply be a bystander. That's a quote. Now, during her youth, even through her university years at Marburg and Heidelberg, Arendt was barely interested in politics or history. Her intellectual passions were philosophy, theology, Greek and Latin classics, and German poetry. 
But with the rise of German anti-Semitism, she became increasingly concerned with politics. And she wrote, at one point, she was hit over the head with history. Arendt not only felt responsible, but she acted. And when her good friend Kurt Blumenthal asked if she would help the Zionist, she was not a member of the Zionist party, by doing research on German anti-Semitic propaganda, she gladly agreed, although it was dangerous to do so. Arendt was apprehended by the Nazis and was interrogated for eight days. But she never revealed what she was doing. And she was extremely lucky because while others were murdered in the cellars of the Gestapo, she was released after eight days. Arendt then decided to escape from Germany illegally. And eventually, he made her way to Paris, the refuge for many Europeans, especially German Jews, escaping from Nazi Germany. He, Arendt remained stateless for 18 years until she became an American, finally became an American citizen. And when she fled Germany, she tells us that what disturbed her most was not what her enemies did, but what our friends did. She's referring to the wave of Glaschalten, the kind of coordination, the widespread participation and going along with the Nazis. She initially strongly reacted against intellectuals and academics the ways in which they became entrapped in their own ideas and failed to assume responsibility for what was happening, failed to understand the reality of the situation. And she tells us, I realized then what I have expressed again and again in a sentence. If one is attacked as a Jew, one must defend oneself as a Jew, not as a German, not as a world citizen, not as a beholder of the rights of man or whatever. Now, initially, turning against her academic background, Arendt decided that belonging to the Jewish people had become her own political problem. She wanted to do practical work, and this is what she did in Paris where she worked for a number of Jewish and Zionist organizations, including Youth Aliyah, the organization that trained European Jewish young people and sent them to Palestine. This is the way in which Arendt initially assumed her own personal political responsibility. In 1940, after seven years of living in Paris, Arendt's life was once again threatened. And just before the Germans invaded France, French authorities rounded up illegal German Jewish refugees, aliens, and sent them to internment camps. Arendt was sent to Gurus in southern France, but she managed to escape from the camp when the Germans invaded France. Once again, Arendt was lucky blessed by the goddess of Fortuna, to whom she frequently refers in her writings. She succeeded in getting a visa to the United States through the intervention of Varian Fry, and she and her husband now narrowly escaped from Vichy, France, traveled across Spain to Port New Portugal, which is neutral at the time, where she finally took a ship to New York, arriving in May 1941. Arendt was now 35. She had never been in an English-speaking country, but she was determined to master English. And within a short time, she was publishing articles in local Jewish periodicals. Shortly after Arendt arrived in New York, no, she wrote an article, We Refugees, which we read in our seminar, where she ironically refers to a new kind of human being, the kind that are put into concentration camps by their foes and internment camps 
by their friends. Throughout her life, I think Arendt wrote uh, with enormous sensitivity about the plight of the stateless and the refugees with, uh, uh, and refugees. She had a regular column in the German Jewish periodical Aufbei. Despite Arendt's skepticism about the failures of intellectuals and academics, she always had a desperate need to understand and to comprehend. As I quoted a passage in class today, in the 1972 at a forum on her work, she said, you know, I could live without acting, but I cannot live without trying to understand. When she was still in Germany, she began investigating in the history of anti-Semitism, and she continued the study during her Paris years. And the fruits of this work are the first part of the origins of totalitarianism. Arendt was not primarily interested in the long history of Jew hatred, which he knew all about, but rather how anti-Semitism had become a political movement in the last decades of the 20th century. And her reflections on responsibility deepened. She felt that there had been a failure of responsibility by European Jewry to fight against political anti-Semitism long before the Nazis came to power. In one of her early English articles, The Jewish Pariah, A Hidden Tradition, she singled out one of her heroes, Bernard Lazar, as an exemplar of the conscious pariah. And Lazar was an early champion in, of Alfred Dreyfus during the infamous Dreyfus Affair that dominated French political life for decades. And confronted with political anti-Semitism, Lazar knew what should be the political response to the pariah status of the Jews. Unlike parvenus who accommodated or even sought to assimilate to the status quo, Lazar knew, and I quote Arendt, that the emancipated Jew must awake to the awareness of his position and conscious of it become a rebel against it, the champion of an oppressed people. His fight for freedom is part and parcel of that which all the downtrodden of Europe must wage to achieve national and social liberation. That's a quote from Arendt. And Arendt adds that every pariah who refused to be a rebel was partly responsible for his own position and therefore a blot on mankind that he represented. Arendt herself was a conscious pariah. Even before the United States entered into the Second War, <clears throat> World War, she called for the voluntary, an international voluntary Jewish army to fight Hitler. And she warned the Jewish people not to give in to cynical disappointment and imagined helplessness, but to assume their responsibility in the fight for their freedom as a people in alliance with others who were being oppressed. She always stressed the importance of alliance. And throughout her life, Arendt was not only a conscious pariah, she was a Selbstdenker, an independent thinker. Her independence, her sense of independent responsibility is illustrated in, with her break with Zionism, which she initially was, she was initially very sympathetic. Uh, Arendt never officially joined any Zionist organization, and she was sympathetic with the Zionists because she felt that unlike parvenus who sought to avoid political responsibility, he, at least they were attempting to do something. But as the Zionist ideology became more extreme and was taken over by revisionists, she felt it was her responsibility to protest. She objected to the way in which Zionists and that were ignoring the Arab Jewish issue, the question. And when they called for 
in a declaration in 1942 for a free and democratic Jewish commonwealth which shall embrace the whole of Palestine, undivided and then diminished. The whole of Palestine at that time meant included the West Bank all the way to Jordan. Arendt supported the founding of a Jewish homeland, but not a Jewish nation state. She called for a single federated country in which Jews and Arabs would cooperate together. And even when the war in 1948 broke out between Jews living in Palestine and their Arab neighbors, she called for a federated state that would rest on Jewish Arab community councils, which would mean that Jewish Arab conflict could be resolved on the lowest and most promising level of proximity and neighborliness. Writing in 1948, she declared, local self-government and mixed Jewish municipal rural councils on a small scale and on as numerous as possible are the only realistic political measures that can eventually lead to a political emancipation of Palestine. But the Zionists attacked Durant. They accused her of an act of betrayal, a stab in the back. At this point, anybody who was not for the founding of a Jewish state was considered someone to betray the cause. Arendt then and always was not intimidated. It, it, she considered herself to be among the responsible, loyal opposition. And she developed, she deplored throughout her life unanimity of the opinion at that time of the professor Zionist. What she wrote at that time has enormous significance for her own understanding of politics and one's responsibility as a citizen in a political community. In a passage that anticipates why plurality is the condition required for political action, this is what she writes. Unanimity of opinion is an ominous phenomenon, one characteristic of our modern mass age. It destroys social and personal life, which is based on the fact that we are different by nature and by conviction. To hold different opinions, to be aware that other people think differently on the same issue, who shields us from God-like certainty, which stops all discussion and reduces social relationships to those of an ant heap. A unanimous public opinion intends to eliminate bodily those who differ. For mass unanimity is not the result of agreement, but an expression of fanaticism and hysteria. In contrast to agreement, unanimity does not stop at certain well-defined objects, but spreads like an infection into every related issue. And she wrote that in 1948. I focused on some of the incidents of her living experience, and there are many more that I could cite, that were really guideposts for her thinking about responsibility and more generally about politics and judgment. Throughout her life, she returned over and over again to thinking about politics, its meaning, its plurality, its dignity, and how it's rooted in our natality. There are those who think that Arendt's understanding of politics is based on a romanticized ideal conception of the Greek polis. I believe that this is a serious misreading of Arendt. On the contrary, it was dwelling on the horrors of totalitarianism that forged her thinking about politics. When she turned to the discussion of totalitarian domination, in the origins. She claimed that the concentration and the camps and the exterminating camps would serve as laboratories in which the fundamental belief of totalitarianism that everything is possible is being verified. She said that the camps are meant not only to exterminate people 
and degrade human beings, but to serve the ghastly experiment of eliminating, being under scientifically cold conditions, spontaneity as an expression of human behavior and of transforming the human personality into a mere thing, into something even animals are not. Right. It's from the origins. And when Arendt spells out the hideous logic of total domination, she distinguishes three analytic stages. The first stage is what she called the killing of the juridical person. And this is what happens when individuals are denied their legal and their political rights, a process that began in Nazi Germany long before the final solution. And in the concentration camps, no inmates have any rights whatsoever. The next decisive step, the second step, this is a kind of analytic analysis. In the preparation of living corpses, she wrote, is the murder of the moral uh, person in man. Arendt always used masculine pronouns when she's referring to human beings. And this, in a chilling passage, this is what she says. Totalitarian terror achieved its most terrible triumph when it succeeded in cutting off the moral per person and individualist escape in making decisions of conscience absolutely questionable and equivocal. When a man is faced with the alternative of betraying and murdering his friends, or sending his wife and children, for whom he is in every way responsible to their death, then even suicide would mean the immediate murder of his family. How is he to decide? The alternative is no longer between good and evil, but between murder and murder. Who could solve the moral dilemma of the Greek mother who was allowed by the Nazis to choose which one of her three children should be killed? But this, for Arendt, was not yet the worst. She wrote that once the moral person has been killed, the one thing that still prevents men from being made into living corpses is the differentiation of the individual, his unique identity. But the ultimate aim, she thought, of totalitarian domination is to kill off any vestige of human spontaneity and individuality. For to destroy individuality is to destroy spontaneity, man's power to begin something new out of his own resources, something that cannot be explained on the basis of reactions to environment and events. Here we touch on something that was absolutely central in Arendt's conception of politics, action, and responsibility. Each of us, as long as we are still human, has the capacity of spontaneity, the power to begin something new. This is what she thinks totalitarianism sought to destroy. So it was by dwelling on horrors of totalitarianism that Arendt came to a deeper appreciation of plurality, individuality, spontaneity that she took to be quintessential to our humanity. The capacity to begin something new and to assume responsibility for our actions. The human condition, like all of Arendt's books, is at once thought-provoking and extremely controversial. And there are many debatable issues concerning her understanding of the vita activa as consisting of the three activities that she calls labor, work, and action. But I want to concentrate on what she has to say about plurality, action, and natality. In her distinctive sense of action, and Arendt is always using words in very distinctive sense, one has to read her carefully. She tells us action is the only activity that goes on directly between 
human beings without the intermediary of things or matter. And it corresponds to the human condition of plurality, to the fact that men, men in the plural, human beings in the plural, not man, live on earth and inhabit this world. While all respects, in all aspects of the human condition are somehow related to politics, this plurality is specifically the condition, not only the condition sine qua non, but the condition pro quam of all political life. Think back to the passage that I cited earlier about the dangers of unanimity of opinion that destroys all social and political life and where the awareness of other people, that other people think differently. He shields us from a godlike certainty that not only stops all discussion, but kills genuine politics. Plurality is a condition of human action because in some one sense, we are all the same. That is human in such a way that nobody is ever the same as anyone else who ever lived lives or will live. And to clarify her distinctive sense of action and politics, Arendt introduces the concept of natality. She's referring not simply to the fact that each of us comes into the world as a unique individual, but to what is even more important, that each of us possesses the capacity to begin something new. Action, in her distinctive sense, has the closest connection with the human condition of natality, the new beginning inherent in the birth that can make itself felt in the world, only because each newcomer possesses the capacity of beginning something new that is of acting. That last part is a quote, actual quote from her. And since action is political activity par excellence, Natality suggests may be the most central category of political thought. Think of all the philosophers who think that death is the central category of human thought. When you rent its natality in bringing something new, new, and it is natality that is for her the source of human freedom. Although a rent stresses the human capacity to begin, to initiate, to set in motion something new, we do not act in isolation. We act in concert with our fellow human beings. I think one of Arendt's most original conceptions is the idea of the public space of appearances. And public spaces do not exist naturally. They need to be artificially created by human beings. These are the spaces into which we speak, act, appear to each other, form and test opinions by debating with one another. Strictly speaking, politics for her arises between human beings. A draw, Arendt draws on the Greek concept of isonomy, political equality, to elucidate politics. Traditionally, the basic political questions have been who rules over whom? What are the different forms of rulership? And what are the sources of their legitimacy? But Arendt conceives of politics in a much more radical fashion. Politics, for her, is a form of no rule. It involves participation with one's peers. Consider the following passage and how she weaves together natality, action, speech, politics, and equality. This is what she writes. The new always happens against the overwhelming odds of statistical laws and their probability, which for all practical everyday purposes amount to certainty. The new always appears in the guise of a miracle. The fact that man is capable of action means that the unexpected can always be expected from him. And he is able to form what is infinitely improbable. And again, this is possible 
only because each human being, each man is unique, so that with each birth, something uniquely comes into the world. If action as the beginning corresponds to the act of birth, if it is the actualization of the human condition of natality, then speech corresponds to the fact of distinctness and is the actualization of the human condition of plurality. That is, of living as distinct and unique being among one's equals. Each of us, as by virtue of our natality, is for rent, as long as we remain human, capable of this kind of action. But action requires the presence of other human beings. And we reveal who we are, our unique distinctiveness, in the space of appearance with the plurality of others. We create these public spaces within which we act and debate together. And she, act, she goes on to say that a life without speech and without action is literally dead to the world. It has ceased to be a human life because it's no longer a lived among human beings. And it is with these public spaces of politics that the tangible, worldly public freedom, she always liked to speak about the tangible, worldly public freedom is manifested. Here she draws upon the philosophers of the 18th century to clarify what she means by public freedom. Their public freedom was not an inner realm in which men escape at will from the pressures of the world, nor was it the liberal arbitrary which makes will choose between alternatives. Freedom for them, and you might say this is true for rent, could exist only in public. It was a tangible, worldly reality, something created by human beings to be enjoyed, enjoyed by men rather than a gift or a capacity. It was the man-made public space of the marketplace, which antiquity had known as the area where freedom appears and becomes visible to all. Now, Arendt, as few others, was deeply aware of the darkness of our times, the lying, the deceit, the corruption, the displacement of truth that was prevalent during her lifetime and I think is so prevalent today. But at the same time, like I made reference to this in the seminar, the pearl diver in uh, Shakespeare's Tempest and like her good friend Walter Benjamin, she sought to achieve from the ruins of the past those moments where the dignity of politics and public freedom have come alive. This is a way I think she approached the Greek polis, the Roman res publica, the American revolution, the councils that spontaneously erupted in widely different historical circumstances from the time of the Paris Commune to the 1956 Hungarian uprise. These are the times when worldly, tangible public freedom come alive and it lasts only as long as humans act together, debate together uh, with their peers. What's so fascinating about Arendt is the way in which he weaves together the concepts of action, plurality, natality, power as empowerment, persuasion, and judgment into a vision of politics and the dignity of politics, a dignity that she feels is getting lost in the modern age. One of the ways she liked to put this is that what she really wanted to do is to tell the story, to recover, to find the categories, to talk about what she claimed was a kind of lost treasure. But Arendt strikingly develops an alternative conception of power as empowerment that dovetails with the conception of action, politics, and public freedom. I mean, what I find so fascinating about Arendt 
is you start, you can start with any of these concepts and you can begin to see how they get integrated and woven into a very thick description of what politics she thinks once was and might still yet be. This is what she says about power. I mean, Arendt certainly understood the traditional conception of power. After all, she wrote the book on totalitarianism. But she, she wants to pose to that. Another concept of power. Power is empowerment. Power comes into being only if and when human beings join themselves together for the purposes of action. And it will disappear when, for whatever reason, they disperse and desert one another. Hence, binding and promising Combining and covenanting are the means by which power is kept into existence, where men succeed in keeping intact the power which sprang up among them during a course, a course of any particular act or deed. They are already in the process of foundation of constituting a stable worldly structure to house, as it were, the combined power of action. This type of power comes into being only among political equals in the public space that they can create together. I want to show how two other concepts are woven into her understanding of the dignity of politics, persuasion and judgment. If politics consists of those public spaces in which we debate together with our peers, where we form and test opinions, then this requires the exercise of good judgment where we seek to persuade our fellow human beings. Arendt knows that in the so-called real world, rational persuasion is frequently confused with manipulation. And she certainly today, we're discovering the extraordinary ways in which social media can manipulate political opinions. Persuasion, as she understands it, requires deliberation and judgment. And although Arendt died just before she finished writing the final part of her life of the mind that would deal with judging, we have important clues in many of her writer writings about what she might have written from, uh, from these early essays. In the essay on the crisis of culture, Arendt makes an original claim that the first part of Kant's critique of judgment where Kant deals with aesthetic judgment, we actually find Kant's unwritten political philosophy. And what does she have in mind? I mean, this is in some ways an outrageous claim, an original claim, but a brilliant claim. What she has in mind is a Kant's analysis of reflective judgment, a mode of thinking that deals with particulars, that doesn't simply try to deduce something from a general or universal rule. rule. Judgment, she says, involves going all the way back to the Greek discrimination and discerning what's distinctive about a particular situation that one confronts. Judgment requires, and she likes to cite this phrase, an at-large mentality wherein one exercises imagination and so is able to think in the place of everybody else. The capacity to judge requires to see things, not only from one's own point of view, from the perspective that all of those who happen to be present. And this is what she writes. The judging person, as Kant says quite beautifully, can only woo the consent of everyone else in the hope of coming to agreement with him eventually. This wooing or persuading corresponds to what the Greeks called python, the convincing and persuading speech which they regarded as the typical form, political form of people talking to one another. Persuasion ruled the intercourse of the citizens of the polis because it excluded physical violence. Kant, she felt, was particularly insightful in basing judgment on the faculty of taste. But taste is not to be identified with private subjective feelings. Taste is based 
of the sensus communis, the sense that fits us into human community. And in inciting Kant, Arendt, I think, is developing one dominant strand in our own understanding of judgment, a distinctive mode of thinking that is neither the expression of mere subjective feeling or the universality characteristic of pure reasoning. It's a mode of discriminative thinking and judgment that deals with particular situations and their concreteness. And this is the type of thinking that Arendt thought was essential for politics itself. So we might ask, what is Arendt doing in elaborating action? natality, politics, public freedom, persuasion, and judgment. She's frequently accused of developing a romantic utopian vision that has little to do with the real world and real politics today. I think that this is a deep misunderstanding of her thinking. When Arendt wrote, and was a favorite theme of her, between past and future. What she always felt is we have to think in that space which is in the gap between past and future. And that's what I think she's always really attempting to do. She is a most unnostalgic thinker and a most unsentimental thinker in at least the traditional sense of unsentimental Ill, Ill, uh, thinking. So it is in a certain way really trying to understand the gap that we live in that I think is the object of Arendt's thinking. And I think she was almost prophetic about what is happening today when she included the discussion with, of totalitarian uh, domination, which I think is the most chilling sentence in the whole book. Because what she wrote is totalitarian solutions may well survive the fall of totalitarian regimes in the form of strong temptations which will come up whenever it seems impossible to alleviate political, social, and economic misery in a manner worthy of human beings. But at the same time, as I've already suggested, Arendt, I think, sought to retrieve and to cover what she called the lost treasure of the revolutionary spirit and of what tangible public freedom once was and might still become. To what end? I think her understanding of politics is really intended to be a critical standard for judging what is lacking in so much of what we call politics today. She certainly not, did not believe in blueprints of action, um, but her thick descriptions of action, politics, public freedom are sources of illumination and critique. In the preface to The Origins, she said that her book was written against the background of reckless optimism and reckless despair. It holds that progress with a capital P and doom are two sides of the same coin. And both, she thought, are articles of superstition, not of faith. Throughout her life, Arendt refused to give, to give in to reckless optimism and reckless despair. She deeply opposed all appeals to historical necessity, whether they tell stories of inevitable progress or inevitable decline. In dwelling on the horrors of totalitarianism, she discovered, I think, what is fundamental to our human condition, our unitality, our capacity to begin something to new, new, and our plurality. Arendt believed that as long as we still have this capacity, then we must not submit to fairy tales of cap progress with a capital P or doom with a capital D or illusions of historical necessity. Although totalitarian regimes of Hitler and Stalin have been overthrown, the specter 
of totalitarianism still haunts us. And I think this is one of the reasons why so many people are drawn to a red today. The specter is still there, and it is becoming increasingly ominous. But against this dark background, Arendt concludes the origins by returning to the theme of new beginnings. This is what she says. This is at the end of the origins of totalitarianism. But there also remains the truth that every end in history necessarily contains a new beginning. The beginning is the promise, the only message which the end can ever produce. Beginning before it becomes a historical event is the supreme capacity of human beings. Politically, it is identical with humans' freedom. She then quotes St. Augustine, who was one of her favorite thinkers, initium un est homo creatus est, that a beginning is made, man was created, said Augustine. That beginning is guaranteed with every new birth. It is indeed every man, every human being. This certainly is not reckless optimism. I see it as a call not to submit to reckless despair. It is a call to assume our responsibility for our political destinies, not to give in to cynicism and indifference, not to opt out of politics. And this requires, I think, reflective judgment where we need, we need to confront the concreteness of particular situations and cannot rely on any accepted rules or standards. This is what she called thinking without a banister. In conclusion, I want to return to the passage that I cited at the beginning of my talk, where Arendt speaks of incidents of living experience that must remain guideposts by which thinking soars and into the depths in which it descends. Arendt was not only a supreme practitioner of thinking, but she returned over and over again to reflecting and questioning the meaning of thinking itself. And she made a sharp distinction between knowledge and thinking. She's always making distinctions. Knowledge for her is the search for truth that can be justified and verified. But thinking is an activity, a process that must be done over and over, and it's concerned with meaning, with making sense of what is happening in uh, for it. Thinking for her is trying to understand, and it remains, thinking for her demands a kind of radical questioning, exposing perplexities and problems. As I pointed out, one of her words that always is recurring, and Anne used it in her own introduction, is perplexities. That's what a rent was, do, uh, was, I think, always concerned with, not with solutions, not with problems, not with standards that can guide. It makes, thinking for her, makes what a stable fluid. She once compared the thinking process to Penelope's web of weaving during the day and unraveling in what she has woven at night. The theme of thinking became especially important for Arendt after the controversy over Eichmann in Jerusalem. Although the deeds that Eichmann performed were monstrous, there's no question about that, she claimed that Eichmann himself was neither monstrous nor demonic. The only specific characteristic that one could detect in his past, as well as in his behavior, was something entirely negative. It was not stupidity, he was very clever, but a curious, quite authentic inability to think. But what did she mean by the inability to think? I think she thought that Eichmann completely lacked that large mentality that Kant had so beautifully described. He never broke out of the cliches 
and the stock phrases of a bureaucrat. He never showed any signs that he had any thoughtful understanding of what he was doing in sending millions of victims to their death. Arendt posed a question to herself. Could the activity of thinking as such, the habit of examining and reflecting on whatever happens to come to pass, regardless of specific content and quite independent of results, could this activity be of such a nature that it conditions man against uh, evil doing? And her answer, I think, was really positive. In questioning the relationship between thinking and evil, she wanted to clarify the type of thinking which could be distinguished from a thirst for knowledge, a type of thinking that could be ascribed, she wanted to identify, a type of thinking that could be ascribed to everyone, not just the educated and the privileged uh, few. And in her search, to understand this distinct, this distinctive type of thinking, and her model becomes Socrates himself. <clears throat> Socrates, he called himself a gadfly and a midwife. And according to Plato, he was called by someone else an electric ray, a fish that paralyzes and numbs by contact with others through being paralyzed by himself. She says, first, Socrates is a gadfly. He, he knows how to arouse his fellow citizens, who without him will sleep on undisturbed for the rest of their lives, unless someone comes along to wake them. Second, Socrates is a midwife. But the irony here is that looking at the Socratic dialogues, there's nobody among Socrates' interlocutors who ever brought thought, a thought that was not a wind egg. But Socrates purged himself of their fixed um, and uh, unquestioned opinions. But it is the third characteristic that Arendt emphasizes, is that was described to Socrates as the most important and relevant for Arendt. Third, Socrates, knowing that we don't know and still unwilling to let it go at that, remained steadfast in his own perplexities and like the electric ray, paralyzes others with whom he comes in contact with these perplexities. It might seem as if the simile of the electric ray is the opposite of the gadfly, but Oren claims, and I quote her, well, we cannot but look upon paralysis from the outside and the ordinary human affairs is felt as the highest state of being alive. What did she mean? It isn't that Socrates knows the answers to the question that he raises. He is and seeks to confuse and perplex others. Rather, he infects them with the perplexities that he himself deeply experiences. This thing, this characterization of Socrates in her essay, Thinking and Moral Consideration, a lecture she gave at the New School, I believe in this very room, 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 is I think what characterizes Arendt as a thinker, a think, thinker, someone who infects others with, who doesn't teach, doesn't give doctrines, doesn't give standards, doesn't give a theory that is the basis of action, but really wants to infect others to make them think with the perplexities that I think that she felt herself. I think what's at once so provocative, annoying, and at times absolutely frustrating, and to be frank, as I say frustrating, is her capacity. He, he, to infect us, her readers, with the perplexities that she deeply experienced. I don't think that one can turn to Arendt for solutions or blueprints for actions and for clear theses about what is to be done, but we might learn from Arendt 
how to engage in that radical, restless, and ceaseless questioning that she took to be the quintessence of thinking without banishes, a type of thinking that it can enhance our sense of responsibility and our form of discriminating judgment. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you could come up here <coughs> or over here, just so we can all get to hear you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, Dick. Thank you again for a very illuminating talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is, like, if you think that Arendt's focus on, on natality would be a good way to resist also like the Agamben reading of thinking of Auschwitz only in terms of death and that way. So if you think that her new, like her understanding of nat like of natality and birth as well yeah. would, would be against that. And also if, if we could think of also that thesis of nativity and natality as also a feminist insight in a way, oh, oh, because oh. she, of her being aware of, as a, I mean, as a woman, at, yeah. on the problem of, of, of birth in that way and how that is also uh, fundamental to, for political understanding. Yeah, um, let me take up the first question and then the second. Um, although, you know, a common claims to be indebted yeah. uh, to a red, I think this point he really misses. I mean, I think one has to be very careful. Uh, you cannot read Arendt simply as optimistic and hopeful. But I do think that what is absolutely fundamental, I mean, she, any story, so she would reject, I think, of Gumbin's Auschwitz story, because that tends to be conclusive. It tends to be, an, and there's no way out. And I think that Arendt felt that as long as we're human, and, and she didn't, hope is not a word she'd like to use, but there is the possibility of new beginnings. And I think that, as I said, in her own lifetime, although there are many, many things she thinks that so much of modernity is undermining this, it, is, it doesn't completely disappear. And it comes alive in the most revolutionary spirit, as she finally described it, can come alive under the most, uh, 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 mo the most radically different historical circumstances, you know, from the Paris Commune to the Hungarian to the early civil rights movement. It's always like the thing I like to cite frequently because this is really historical fact. Um, you know, I've always been annoyed by people who think, well, she's just romantic and she's unpractical. But when Adam Mishnik, who was one of the great founders of the Solidarity Movement, in, was in prison in the 1980s in Poland, and before the movement comes alive, he wasn't reading John Rawls. He was reading Hannah Arendt. And that's what they saw. They saw the possibilities of, you know, and how power can grow, how it can begin, and so forth. That is an Arendtian theme. And a theme. So in that respect, you know, I mean, there are deep problems with the rent because I think she never solved the problem and I think anybody solved the problem. How do you preserve it? How do you house it? And you know, this is I think something she's struggling with her book on revolution. Now the second point is of course certain ironies in the fact that she never had any children, you know, but uh, you're with uh, my, uh, with Chiara, uh, Baraci, our thing, who does think that that's a feminine insight. Uh, I'm not sure that Arendt yeah. herself would have said yeah. that. But, um, you know, uh, there are certain things, I think from a third person point of view, that Arendt is sensitive as a thinker that not many political thinkers have been. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, I think this is also true of, even though she draws on Jesus of Nazareth, in terms of how many people put forgiveness into their political mm -hmm. thinking as well as natality. So I think, I know, I, I, one thing I feel confident that Arendt would resist 
the claim that yes. this is feminine. But I think that uh, you have to decide that for yourself. That the, ca ca the category is fundamental for her thinking yeah. and suggests that it might be the most fundamental political one. And this, I think, you know, I mean, this is, in fact, this is one of the reasons I talked about her objections to historical necessity. Um, the first time I met her, on rent, we argued about Marx and Hegel because that's the way she read them. Mm -hmm. They think that freedom can come out of necessity, and she thought that, and I was telling her, you know, we argued, as I say, for six hours. I still think she's wrong. <laughs> But she was constantly emphasizing in the capacity to begin something new as being intrinsic to what she took to be the dignity of politics. Thank you. No. I can't believe that's the only question. <laughs> All right. All right. I think what they want, if you have questions, is to get by the microphone. Okay. Hi. Um, in so much as it seems like Arendt is focusing on the aspect of thinking, which is questioning, doubting, yeah. um, which has a, a powerful political effect. It destabilizes certain things that right. need to be questioned and understood more deeply. Uh, also, as an experience, as something someone lives through thinking, for a lot of people, it, it's destabilizing in a discomforting way, right? It's destabilizing yeah. in a way that's, that can be frightening, scaring, disorienting to people. How would she, because it's politically important, how would she kind of woo the, the public into thinking more when you know, there are these qualities that go along with thinking that can be troubling for a lot of people? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, let me say something that's relevant to your question and then uh, uh, try and deal with it directly. In the essay on thinking and moral considerations, you know, uh, she goes through the accusation that this kind of radical question leads to nihilism, you know, and she takes the point, I mean, she deals with the Platonic dialogues. I mean, after all, most of Socrates, you know, talking to Alcibiades and Calicles, they turn out to be tyrants from this. But she thinks that that is not really, I mean, that is, that's looking for another message, another thing to live by. So she doesn't think that nihilism is necessary, but it is. So because nihilism for her turns into be a substitute for another form of absolutism. Uh, I think on the kind uh, on the issue of you know she was not she did believe strong that everyone has a capacity to do this. This is not something of the privilege, and it's not depending about it. Um, upon education. And there are remarkable incidents where we can see that people in certain situations stop and think, right, in the thing. In terms of, you know, the issue how to make it widespread, how to get people really to think, I think the only answer that she has is, I mean, not the answer, is you have to infect them with their, with their kinds of perplexities. I think that she knew quite well, and, and, and indeed, that people don't want to think. They want to live by it. It's, it's like the thinking, the expression thinking without bound banisters. She knew deeply that people are always searching for some banister, something to hang on, on, on to. So she understood that as a kind of tendency, but she thought it was dangerous. She's, she, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I can't quite quote. She said there are no dangerous thoughts. Thinking itself is dangerous because it calls things into question. But what's more dangerous is not thinking. Okay. So that's an answer or not an answer. Certainly, she was not going to give a program about how to teach people how to think aside from what she had to say. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I've always found. Uh, Arendt's uh, relationship to Zionism fascinating. Uh, and Relation with what? Zionism. Yeah. Zionism. And, yeah. and thank you for laying out the Mine. sort of her history and her, uh, her, her reservations. But why, the question is very simple. Why do you feel she was in favor of a Jewish homeland but not a Jewish state yes. in Palestine? And if I could just add, if it's because she felt it would necessarily uh, impinge on the Palestinians, 
do you believe she would be, or do you, do you, in her writings does she talk about the idea of a Jewish state uh, that would not uh, displace uh, another yeah. people? She doesn't speak in those specific terms because, but here it goes uh, to a deeper theme. Um, Arendt thought there was something fundamentally unstable about the notion of the nation state. And now she's not referring to what we now call globalization. But she thought that the nation state, as she conceived it, is something that really emerged in the 18th century. Okay? Now, she makes a sharp distinction between the nation and the state. I'm going to try and show why this is so relevant. Nation refers to you know, history, the myth of cultural homogeneity, language, and so forth. State for her is, has to do with rights of citizenship. And what she saw, and rightfully saw, is that what was winning out over the state part was the nation part. And you see, this is one of the reasons, as I was saying in my seminar, I think she's so relevant today, and then I'll talk about, about Israel, because when we begin to speak, who are the true Hungarians? Mm -hmm. Who are the true Americans? You know, when you begin to begin saying that people living in the same territory don't have really the same rights as others, then she believes that this leads to a kind of disaster. And so, in a way, that's exactly what she was worried about. Mm -hmm. It would have happened when, I mean, of course, she's writing about Palestine in that time. And uh, I have to say, if I give my own opinion, unfortunately, that is what has happened. You know that, uh, and when, you know, when Oren says in 1948, there'll never be peace unless Arabs and, and work, work together. And the whole idea, it seems to me, whether, I mean, whether you're sympathetic or unsympathetic, but the issue of occupation, I mean, for her, what she saw immediately, in fact, she goes back all the way after the second World War to minority children. There's no way to guarantee second-class citizens' rights. Mm. They are either part of a polity or they're not. And that's what she was worried about. But she did think that, you know, she was certainly sympathetic with the idea of one idea in the history of Zionism, that this is a place that they need a place, this is a place where Jewish culture can grow and develop. And she, I mean, it's so Arendtian to say, this is the only realistic solution when it, you know, many people thought there was no, I mean, it, it, when she says it's not too late, it clearly was too late. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't say this with any kind of, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to get into the whole issue of kind of Zion, but I think if anybody saw deeply what would be the kinds of issues that could rip up the whole, I mean, at least just focusing on the thing, Oren saw that already in the 40s, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. right? and so that's, okay. at least there's a lot more to say about, about her, and, uh, uh, but she is, you might, if you know something about the history of the Zionism, you know what a lonely voice she was mm -hmm. at in that time. Because there were a group, there was a small group at, uh, around the Hebrew University who really favored that way of going and really thought it could be a real political solution if the UN had operated properly. Uh, but that's a very small minority, the yes. group that we made, uh, that consisted of uh, the group called Ichud. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. One of the most pressing, perhaps the most pressing problem of our time seems to be the environmental crisis. And I'm wondering, you know, Haran's, Haran's uh, emphasis on activity yes. and freedom to, to create rather than freedom from necessity, that, that seems to uh, assume, it seems to me, a kind of limitlessness to human, human creation that yeah. seems in some ways at odds with the kinds of limits that we perhaps need to impose on ourselves in order to uh, live sustainably and, you know, in, a, in an environmentally uh, sustainable way. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about what well, Arun would say with well, regard to the environmental well, crisis I, of our time? I never like to be in a position of what Arun would say today, because I, one thing I know would probably be unpredictable, except that she would be horrified by what's going on in the political world, all over the world. Um, this raises, and I really don't, I would have to give another lecture, 
uh, on this. Very complicated. You see, look, I'm going to give a roundabout answer, and then I'll try and come directly. Um, I think anybody who reads Arendt carefully will frequently have the uh, impression she's overstating it. She's exaggerating, OK? Uh, and she is. And this once came up in a, her correspondence with Carl Jaspers in a very different context. She says, honey, you're exaggerating. And she got furious, not furious, but she wrote back, exaggeration. You can't think without exaggerating. And besides, look at the world out there. You know. So there is a sense in which I think that Arendt is frequently overstating things in order to make her, her point, because she thinks that we've lost sight of it, that we're not seeing things. Um, and uh, uh, in one of the most troubling distinctions in Arendt is the distinction between the political and the social, you know, where she even wants to put economics into the social. I think ultimately this distinction will not stand up. And I even have been very critical of Arendt on the way she draws the distinction between the social and the political itself. At the same time that I say this, I understand why she was doing it. Because she thinks that the way in which we think about politics today, in terms of administration and seeing and even in kind of welfare, is losing sight of what she really wants, you know, what she thought thinks has been exhibited in certain things, what she called the revolutionary spirit. So there's a certain sense, I don't want to get her off the hook, because I'm very critical of her on this particular issue, but you can see the point of why she's doing it, because she's speaking to something, I mean, I was saying this in my seminar today, which I think people de deeply feel that in some ways, you know, they look at the world in themselves. I see this with my own students. What they want to do is really find some kind of meaningful participation, some ways in which they can really act, some ways in which they can display themselves. And the world around us is one in which there are very little opportunities in certainly what we call politics. So in that sense, it seems to me a rent is speaking to something that is still a very deep human age, although I urge, although you know, when we get into the way in which you will exaggerate the difference between the social and think that this is completely obliterating the politics, I mean, in some ways she wrote, sometimes she even wrote as if politics is over. I mean, that's, uh, but I think that's a minor motif in, in her. So I think there are lots of real issues. I sometimes think that a better way of putting a rent, it's not quite the way she put it, but it's the way I put it, that you could see that here, that there are what she called social dimensions of any problem. There are technical things where you have to know. I mean, we might even face this in terms of what's going on in Korea and nuclear disarmament. There are all kinds of technical things. There you need experts. But then there are political issues which can be debated. If something can legitimately be debated, that for her is a political issue. Okay, you know but she didn't always say what I'm saying. She should have said. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. A final question. Thank okay. you. Please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much. Um, my question is about pragmatism, uh, and and maybe there's no answer t to the question because. Um, in my the way I'm here, I heard your lecture. Um, I thought you were giving somewhat of a pragmatist reading of Arendt um, in both, uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, both the, con the focus on concrete action, uh, the sort of Emersonian focus on new beginnings. You said that she's yeah. against reckless optimism and despair and never used the word hope, really, but there does seem to be some kind of impetus towards a, a democratic hope, some kind right. of grounded democratic yeah. hope, maybe. Um, and so if that's, I guess, so if that is correct, like some, um, would you say, I, I'm wondering in what ways Arendt was not a pragmatist? Well, I, uh, I don't really want to go into that, which okay. is not, but let me go into the positive part. 
Okay. I think there's clearly overlap. I mean, uh, uh, that, um, uh, I mean, I know this because we discussed it. I mean, I, as you may know, I'm, one of the things I work on and do is work in, in private. Yeah, that's why I uh, <laughs> Let me put it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, if we take, just let's focus on a figure like Dewey. There are a lot of differences between them, and I don't mean, I'm, I'm a little bit edgy, even though I'm identified in this with any kind of ist, and she certainly was. But in terms of a vision of community, mm -hmm. of political participation, of fallibility, uh, of different kinds of opinions and so forth, clearly there is a kind of overlap, at least with that kind of message that emerges from this. I mean, I think you have to say, though, uh, I mean, if we're going to draw differences, again, whether you like it or not, I mean, um, uh, Arendt was skeptical about pragmatism. She was skeptical about whether the, she's much more in a Republican, I mean, a small Republican, mm -hmm. in the Republican tradition of participation, but whether this could be extended to mass society, she was rather skeptical. And in that respect, I think you would find tensions between her and someone like Dewey. Okay? Sure. Yeah. But I might, I never like to mention my own, but in one of the books that I once wrote called The Abuse of Evil, I talk about the similarities between certain Arendtian themes and certain pragmatic themes. But I would like to think I'm giving an Arendtian reading of Arendt, not a pragmatic reading of Arendt. <laughs> Thank you. Okay? Thank you, Dick, okay. for sharing your dialogue.